Welcome to the seventh lecture, everybody. Um, today we're going to be talking about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart because it's related to what a lot of what I've been working on for the last uh, two years. This is uh, how we digest the data, so how we decide what data to keep and how we process it. All right, so just a reminder about the schedule. All right now in the seventh lecture, there's going to be a lecture next week where we're going to talk about data analysis and statistics. Um, and then there's two weeks with no lectures. So there's Thanksgiving week, and then on the seventh, there is the physics with a bang program, which many of you are probably familiar with, but um, it's where there's the general physics lecture here. Um, so next week, I'll bring more information about it, and I'll post it on the website. Um, but so two weeks off, and then, and then one more. Um, right, so what, we, what we're going to talk about today. So we'll, as usual, start with a brief review of last week. Um, and then I'll talk about this process called triggering, which is deciding which data to keep, because as you'll learn, we cannot keep all of the data that is uh, produced by the LHC. Um, and then I'll talk about how we make sense of the data. And what I mean, at, at this stage, next week we'll talk about how we analyze it, but at, the, at this stage, all I'm going to talk about is how we take those electronic signals from the detector and turn them into things like electrons and muons um, and jets. Um, and then we'll talk about the grid, which is really at the back, which is as important, I believe, as the LHC itself and as the detectors, um, because the grid is a computing infrastructure that allows us to actually analyze the data. And if we couldn't analyze the data, then there would be no haste discovery. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then um, there's a lot of show and tell in this, this lecture. And so I'm not actually sure how long it's going to take. So if, um, if we do have time, I'll also talk a little bit about my project at the very end. If we don't, I'll, just, um, I'll make sure we get to that in one of the next two lectures. You guys see all the pictures before the bullets come up. But <laughs> at any rate, let's review last week. So um, last week we learned that um, special relativity states that the laws of physics are the same in all reference frames. So we looked at this picture of the boy standing in the back of the pickup truck, and as far as the boy is concerned, he's at rest when he throws his ball up and comes back down to it. But his father, who's biting his nails on the street, is probably about to yell, I don't know. Um, is watching his son, and he sees the ball go in the parabola, but gravity works the same for the boy as it does for the father. So both can, can calculate the tra trajectory of the ball in their reference frame, and the two pictures are compatible. Um, we also learned that observers in different reference frames measure different energy and momentum. So in this case, the boy measures that the ball has no forward momentum, whereas the dad measures that the, that the ball has forward momentum. Um, but we always measure the same invariant mass. So there are these invariant quantities that are the same no matter what reference frame you're in. So we talked about the Higgs last week, and we said this is our Higgs produced at rest. And in the reference frame of the Higgs, its energy is just purely related to its rest mass energy, or its mass. And then when it decays to two photons, these two photons have to have the same, what we call, invariant mass as this Higgs photon. But if we were to look in the lab frame, the Higgs is produced with some momentum, because we can't produce the Higgs uh, without, we can't specify that the Higgs is produced without any momentum. So we don't know what its momentum is. Um, and so the photons that are produced in this reference frame will have some momentum, but if we sum up energy and the momentum in the correct way, we will measure the same invariant mass. So that's how we can always measure the Higgs mass, no matter what the decayed topology looks like, basically how the particles are, are um, produced. And then the last thing that we talked about was what quarks and gluons look like in our detector. So we learned that when a quark is produced, um, the first thing it does is it, sh it radiates other quarks and gluons. And then those quarks and gluons form particles, hadrons, such as protons, um, the basically bound state of quarks and quarks and antiquarks. And then those deposit the energy in our detector, as, um, which we reconstruct as jets. So this is a picture from the Atlas detector of what a jet looks like. Here you see the charged particle tracks. 
Here you see the um, deposit in the electromagnetic calorimeter, and here's the deposit in the hadronic calorimeter. And when we see a deposition like this, where there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of tracks, there's a lot of energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter, and also there's energy in the hadronic calorimeter, we know we've seen a jet. I'm going to get a new not dead. Um, or to the particles or the gluons? Well, so the, so the mass that we measure um, when we like, put something on the scale, that's mainly the, the energy, the binding energy of the um, proton, basically, or the, the electromagnetic binding energy of, of the atom. And so that, um, that's because we have mass and energy are essentially equivalent in these frames. So as far as gravity is concerned, so as far as gravity is concerned, mass and energy are equivalent. So, so the Higgs is giving mass to the energy directly. So, so the Higgs is giving mass to the fundamental particles. Mm -hmm. So it's giving mass to the quarks, to, to anything that doesn't have substructure. And I mean, the photon is massless and the gluons are massless. So the Higgs is basically just giving mass to those particles that um, the, the quarks and the leptons and the gluons. But practically for the mass that we measure, so macroscopic mass, this is mainly binding energy. Great. All right, so let's move on. I just wanted to show one more. These are, are pretty pictures of jets in the event. So um, each one of these towers, this is an event with six jets, actually seven, I think. Um, and each one of these towers shows what a jet looks like in our detector. And we also talked about how certain jets are special, so they have can take jets from B quarks, bottom quarks are special, um, and they contain these displaced vertices. So we can look and see if there is a place where a particle traveled and then decayed, um, and we know that those jets have contained uh, B quarks. That was another thing that we can see within our detector. All right, so now let's talk about deciding what data the LHU wants to so remember, this is this is what one of our events looked like. And each piece here of that you see, each little green piece here, each line here, represents a measurement in the, in the detector. It represents some element of the detector saying, I saw this much energy. And so to read out all of these many, many pieces of energy in every event is difficult. That means you have a lot of information that's being produced every single event. So this just shows in the, in the transverse plane, and you can see um, this is another detector that images um, events very finely. And each little white dot here is a piece of information. So that's a massive amount of information. So it's really um, a deluge of data. And this is happening 40 million times per second. So 40 million times per second, we're having all this information being produced. Oops. Okay. So let's talk about how much information that really is. 
So each event is 1.25 megabytes. So what is a megabyte? So one megabyte is about a 500 page book. So Leon Letterman's book about the God particle has about as much information as one LHC event. Now for contrast, the human genome um, has 800 megabytes. So at least for, you know, 800 for <laughs> successfully. <laughs> Uh, six, you know, 600 events are uh, contain the same energy as the human genome. And so, when we're doing this at 40 million times per second, that's producing 40 terabytes of data per second. And to put that into terms that is maybe somewhat comprehensible, that means that there's five times the Library of Congress's printed collection. So you took every single book in the Library of Congress, we'd be producing this uh, five times this per second, that amount of data. Or if you put it in terms of money, so your modern computers can have a two terabyte hard drive, you know, the kind of top end personal computers would have maybe a four terab or two terabyte hard drive. That would be, um, you know, $2,500 worth of two terabyte disks every single second. Wow. So this is an absolutely massive amount of data. Um, so that's a problem. It's way too much. I mean, we can't possibly process two, you know, two, $2,500 worth of data or five times the library of Congress's printed collection every second. Just can't do it. It's impossible. But luckily, most events look like this. If you forget the fact this is, an, um, this is a generic event, I think there's 20 different vertices in here. There are two new ones in here, so I want you to ignore them, pretend like you didn't see them. But what you see is there's some random there's random amounts of energy splattered in the calorimeters. Um, there's a whole lot of tracks, but there is not these like big spectacular jets that we saw here. <coughs> so what what I'm trying to say with this is that most events are kind of boring. So they, they don't not much not much is going on. So we can exploit that fact to reduce the data to a manageable rate. Basically. We don't need to measure every single event that looks like this. We could just measure one out of every 10,000 of these events. And since they all are pretty boring, we only need a small fraction of them to understand them. So the data is gone forever? The yes. stuff that you throw away? Yes. It is, which is dangerous. So we can we'll talk about this in a little bit. But it is gone forever. There's nothing we can do with it. Um, so. What we do is that in order to turn this data into, um, into a uh, manageable rate is that we, we throw out 99.999% uh, of it. We don't look at 99.999% of it. And that's okay because the Higgs is produced one out of every billion events. So that's one plus eight zeros, sorry, a dot plus eight zeros and then one. And that's, that's how often basically a Higgs is produced. And so, we want to catch every Higgs event, and we only have to write one out of every billion events, of course. We want to have more than just the Higgses, so we write out more than that, but that just gives you a scale of how often interesting physics happens. And so this process is called triggering. So this is actually a really, I think, beautiful um, illustration of the triggering process. So there is this uh, scientist, I'm not, I'm not sure if he is a physicist or an engineer on the CMS experiment, and he's done a whole set of uh, drawings of things related to the CMS detector, but in the style um, of da Vinci. So you can go to this link and see it at this whole gallery. It's really beautiful. But what he's showing here is this is a pile of books. So this is supposed to be the CMS uh, triggering system. So this is a pile of books that's been discarded. So each one of these books represents an event. So as I told you, one megabyte is about the size of a 500-page book, so each one of these is an event. And then you see different levels here of uh, numbers of books that save. So you have one level here that has a lot of books, then the number of books gets fewer, and then also they kind of stopped drawing it. Um, so this would be the final stage of, of books that, that you keep. But that's the idea. We're taking this pile of books, we're throwing most of them away, but then we're keeping some for further inspection. All right, and so how do we do this? This is, this is a multi-step approach. So imagine this is our event. This is our event if we were able to read out the detector perfectly, every event. So what we do is since we can't, we can't see the information this precisely um, 40 million times a second, but we can see the information about this precisely 40, 40 million uh, times a second. So 
So we can look at it in a very coarse grained way, which we do by using really fast electronics that um, look at large regions of the detector and sum up the amount of information. And so what we can see from here is that, oh, you know, I see that I have a blob of energy in the calorimeter. Oh, I have another blob of energy in the calorimeter. And oh, I've got some hits in these muon systems. And I can see about that much at this level. I can't really make out, I can't make out any of these tracks. Um, and I can't make out any of this sort of really soft energy. But when there's a lot of energy in one region, I can make it out. And when I have hits in these muon systems, I can make it out. And so that's what we do with the first step, is we look at the detector in a very coarse grained way. Um, then, once we've reduced the data, and we'll tell you how much we reduce it in a few slides, um, once we've done that first stage of reduction, what we can do is we can look in just these narrow regions for what's interesting. So here's, here in this case, we looked in this region where this new one was, and we decided to take all the detector information from that part. And so then we can say, oh yes, there really was a muon here. Or for this electron, we look in, we just read the, read the detector out in this little cone, and we see, oh yes, there, there really was an electron there. And so that's the second stage. We can't, we still, it's still way too much data to read out the entire detector, but um, we can read out these little regions and just use the information in those little regions. And then the last stage is to take the full picture and to uh, make a decision based off of everything we've seen in the event. So that's how we decide what data to keep. So this first stage, it reduces the rate from 40 megahertz down to 100 kilohertz. So that is that gives us all but about 0.25%. That throws away all but 0.25% of the events. The second stage reduces that by another factor of 25, and the last stage reduces it by another factor of 8. So our total output is now 500 hertz. Out of that initial 40 megahertz, it's 500 hertz. And that ends up being about 625 um, megabytes per second. And what that ends up being is still a massive amount of data. I mean, that's 54 terabytes per day, um, but that is actually manageable. Um, <coughs> So what I wanted to make, make sure, yeah, okay, I'll go through that next. But let's stop for a second and ask, you know, see if anybody has questions at this point. Yeah. Do you have any pictures of things you reject? Uh, yes. Okay. So, so what we do, so what we do is we have, in order to make sure that, that there's a few things that we do. So one, one thing we do is we save events that look really, really weird, which we're 99.99% sure is an electronics malfunction, something that doesn't satisfy all of our criteria, but just looks weird in the detector, we save all those, just to make sure we're not missing anything spectacular. And then the second thing we do is we randomly sample those boring events. So we have something that just randomly saves every <coughs> thousandth event, well, it's actually not thousandth, it's probably more like every 10,000th event, and then we look at those as well. So we can have an, an unbiased sample as well. Yeah? You get 40 million events a second. Do you run it for a full second? And then do the processing? Ah, so no, it's a continuous pipeline. So it's, it's continuous. So basically what happens is that um, at, at this stage, these, these, what, what, these, what these things are doing is there's electronics that are on these that are, are looking at the events as they come, and they have about 10 microseconds to make their decision. And in those 10 microseconds, um, it throws out the event or keeps it. So it's looking at 40 million events in 10 microseconds? Um, well, it's not 40, so it's 40 million events, it's whatever, it's whatever um, one second, the number of events is whatever 40 million divided by 10 microseconds is. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's, you know, okay. several tens or hundreds or something per, per second. But that's what we call in a, in a data, it, we store that data in what we call a buffer. So while one event is being looked at, the next one, the next ones are waiting and then it, and it does this such that it can have a decision um, on every 40 megahertz event. So things could be happening between the events that are missed because the computer is busy processing? No, no so cool. we set up our systems, the, what, what is called dead time limits. And yes, only when, so basically yes, but only when the system is malfunctioning. So basically, um, there's electronics on, there's electronics on, on these detector elements 
that only read out the data if there's a signal. So if there's no signal, then they're not reading it out. And so what we want is that the average occupancy of an element of the detector, so the average number of times that it has something in it per collision, is low enough such that the event can be processed quickly enough to, to process every single 40 megahertz event. So basically, if I had, you know, if I had, uh, if I didn't have anything in this, in this uh, element, readout element, I wouldn't look, I wouldn't process it. I only process it when it's got something in it, and that rate is low enough such that you can process all events in 40 megahertz, at 40 megahertz speed. You said it's the average. Is it possible that something could happen, an event could occur during the processing? Um, well, so, they, so they're buffered. The thing that can happen is that too many events can pile up while another event is processing. Too many events can be waiting, and we can only store, uh, I, don't, I don't know, it depends on which det detector to detector how many events, uh, de sub-detector to sub-detector how many events they can store. But um, if that, what we call the buffer, fills up, so if that queue fills up, then we start losing events. And that's what we call dead time. But that only happens to us, so our data taking a, a efficiency was, I think that only happened to us about 5% of the time in the entire last year. So it's, um, we're very, we, we set ourselves up so that that doesn't happen a lot. Yeah? I'm going to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but I really don't. Okay. <laughs> the question is simply this. Is this like the so-called random Monte Carlo sampling for each of the devices, be it for a new or, or, or I like on the device? <clears throat> is it like that, or I put it all together wrong? Um, so for these devices, what they do is they all have internal thresholds. So it basically says, if I see an energy deposit that's greater than you know, a certain amount, then I decide that it's triggered. So that's really what we're doing here, is we're taking, we have thresholds that are set, and the detector's continually looking for something that is above a given threshold, and then we decide to read it out. Yeah? So you know that Higgs boson's found in every one billion collisions, mm -hmm. right? So how many have you found so far? So that depends on what channels. So we'll, we'll talk about that next week. We'll go through the numbers in detail next week. Well, I mean, statistically, has it proven out to be one billion? It has one in a billion. So you yeah. found a bunch of them. Like, yeah, yeah. So um, you've got all these collisions going on. So right. So that a is one of the is a big number, but you get a lot of collisions. So. Exactly. So we do measure it. We have measured the rate at which they yeah. happen, and it is um, is it is definitely consistent with the expectation. And next week we'll go over how well we know it. So there's always an error on how, just based on the number of events that we've recorded. Um, so we know within a certain amount of certainty that it's consistent with that one billion. But it is, it is consistent. It's a consistent. And the other thing I just want to ask was, when, and I missed a couple lectures, so if you went over this, I'm sorry. Um, when you collide the, the, um, um, the proton, mm -hmm. okay, um, you narrow the beam, so that you can maximize the concentration of the yep. protons as best you can, right? Mm -hmm. And slam it in. So are you are you tweaking that to be able to concentrate the beam even more? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that's um, the LHC operators, that's something they're constantly doing. Is what we call it the beam brightness. Okay. And they're trying constantly trying to maximize the beam brightness. Oh, you probably already mentioned that, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure we went through that in detail, but yeah. Yes. Oh, and one here and then here. Uh, this is kind of an aside, but you mentioned the human genome yeah. is equal to 800, 500 page books. Uh, I think that was your number. Yeah. Uh -huh. 800 megabytes. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. That must uh, be food for a lot of research. Do you happen to know any centers of where that was? Is any going on here at this university? Well, or? Probably. So the human genome project, the, the project that mapped that out, is a multi billion dollar, I don't know how many people, it's not as big as the LHC. Scale, but I think it was the largest biology project ever so far. So it's a massive, massive project. Yeah. Could you talk about um, the time the system malfunction and uh, in your experience, how many times that happened, and have, have those those events been uh, analyzed to find the new Yeah. So, so there's different parts of the detector malfunction for different reasons. So. One of the parts that happened most frequently, one of the limiting, actually it ended up 
limiting the, the rate that we could take data at was um, uh, not, I'm trying to think if I have it on better, no, I don't have a better picture of it now. Oh, yeah, here. So um, this system here, right here, these are the muon systems, the, the, what we call the forward muon system, so that the beams are colliding in here, um, and then you have these detectors right here, which get pretty close to the beam at this point. So the problem with that, um, basically, as the beam is traveling around the detect around the LHC, sometimes it hits other parts of the LHC and makes new particles, not Higgs bosons, they're lower energy, but what this means is that the beam is traveling with a wide array of other particles around it, much further from the interaction point, but, but out to sort of this radius. And so basically, these detectors were getting hit by constantly hit by particles that weren't associated with the collision. And so that was saturating that rate that I was talking about, that those buffers where you could hold a number of events. Um, and so we could only read these out at a lower rate than we were normally able to because they were already being saturated by other things. So one of the things that's been done right now since we're not running is they're installing more uh, shielding to try to stop those particles before they get to that part. Um, they're also improving the electronics to make it a little bit faster so that it can cope with this better. So that's one of the, the best examples. The other example, for example, uh, that, well, another example is that the little readout elements that make all these tracks, occasionally there's just a little mis malfunction and one individual element, one of, um, oops, sorry, one of these sensors here sometimes you'll just lose the ability to communicate with it for you know, a few hours, and so that's another place where that, that would happen. But the total efficiency was 95%. And these events um, are unexpected events. Um, did they happen in any kind of time frame? Like, is it a number for them over a certain period of time? Or? Um, so, so for example, so for these things, this is just random. Um, no, not, I mean, so, not, not really, so, in the sense that they weren't really correlated with much, I mean, this sort of stuff was correlated with how clean the beam was, so how much extra junk was around it, and we can measure that in other places, so we, so we, we know that that's where that is coming from. For the losing the ability to talk to the module, the little sensor, that happens randomly, um, and it's just a normal part of operating. So we can't have 100% efficiency, but, um, but, but yeah. It's kind of an interesting. I wasn't worried about it. I just thought it was really interesting. And sometimes you find things uh, between the cracks. You know, yeah. Yeah, and that's why we have this special, um, this special what we call data stream for these weird events to make sure because there's some. So, so, so for example, one, one. Um, this is kind of related to this. One, some models of new physics predict that you could have a new particle produced that you couldn't see and it would travel into the detector, and then it will, um, much later, it will decay. So randomly, at some random time, you'll see a big splash of energy in your detector that's not associated with anything else. And so we have special um, triggers set up to look for that. Um, and so that's the sort of thing where it's not really what we're expecting, but we try to make sure that we're able to look at it too. Yeah? In some places, in, in some of the show, uh, slides you show that there's curve. Yes, there is. So I can. So in this case, this plane that we're looking at here, um, this is the the beams. The beams are colliding in this direction here, and the magnetic field in this direct. The magnetic field is lined up along this direction, and so there's no bending in this plane. But in this plane here, um, so in this plane here, the, the magnetic field is perpendicular, and so you do get bending tracks. There, but there's another thing, there's another thing too. So, so these guys aren't really bent at all. And that's because they're really high energy. So the amount of bending tells us how high energy the particle is. Sorry, say that again. Oh, sure. So these guys are straight, right here. Yeah. And that's because they're very high energy. So they just don't get bent very much. All right. Okay, so um, I wanted to, so this is sort of the hardware with which we do this. So um, 
these two, this represents um, some of that first stage, that coarse grain. And, and what you're supposed to see here is that this is custom electronics. This doesn't look like um, a, 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 any sort of normal computer. And so we have very specialized things to do this. Um, this just shows you a picture of a room where all these custom electronics are. And there's tons and tons of huge fat cables bringing in all the data. And then the second two levels um, the, are processed in computers. So this is a server room like you'd see at, if you went to Google's, well, I guess you probably can't go to Google servers. I think they're pretty mysterious. But any sort of standard um, big computing facility will have racks of computers like this. And so um, that's what we do at second level. But we use all this custom electronics to do that. And I wanted to show you guys um, on a very small scale what, the, what sort of electronics look like. So, sorry. The, basically, what this is here, this is a little box, box of electronics. Can't really see much. It's just like a, just looks like the added screen. Um, and then we have two detectors here. So this is um, a piece of scintillator. So when a charged particle passes through it, it produces light. And this is this is a, um, a readout element here and another readout element here. And so basically, both of these two. So there's two pieces of the scintillator, and both of these two are looking for signals in it. And so I have it off right now, but when a particle passes through these two, it'll both the top one and the bottom one will see a signal. And so that's when we, we know that there was something real there. So what I have is this thing, which um, unfortunately, since I wish this was built differently, but you can see that there's this counter and it's incrementing, it's changing. So it might be, I'll keep this so that everybody can look at it afterwards. Um, but this is counting events. And so it's counting when it sees a hit and when it sees something in both sides. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I might have. There we go. <laughs> um, when it sees something in both sides of these two um, detectors. And so what we're seeing is cosmic rays coming through this detector right now. Um, and what I wanted to show you is that if I turn off the fact, if I turn off looking at one or the other, and I just look at, let's just say this one. Then this, this rate goes crazy because there's all sorts of noise and things that aren't actually particles that are making light in here. So that's the sort of thing in a very general sense. Um, what we're looking for in this hardware is the coincidence of multiple things that look like a particle at once. So we, you guys can look at this later, but um, yeah, I guess it, it's kind of a, a very simple a, a way of showing what we do on a very large scale. Here. All right, so then the question is, after we have this, um, I lost my pointer. Four. Ah, yes. Thanks. All right, so now what? So now we've got this 54 terabytes of data a day, and then we need to take what are just hard, you know, signals from electronics in the detector and turn it into physics objects. And this is called a process called what we call reconstruction. So we use computer algorithms to find these physics, what we, these physics objects. We call an electron in the detector a physics object, or a muon a physics object, as opposed to one calorimeter cell that has a certain amount of energy. So we turn calorimeter cells, groups of calorimeter cells into um, electrons. We take muon trajectories in the outer system and in the inner system, and we match them together, and we say that's a muon, or we ca calculate I look at all the momentum in the event, or the tran what we call the transverse momentum, the momentum not in the direction of the beam, is that, ha is that zero or is that, does it have some non-zero value? So that's, this is the process called reconstruction. And it's hugely complex. So this is a table which has really no meaning other than, than to show that when one event is processed, each one of these little red blobs is an algorithm that's run. So we've got 100, I mean, okay, this is, and this is only a segment of it. This is not, it's not the full, this is not the full set. But we basically have, you know, hundreds of algorithms running on this data, and it's implemented in millions of lines of code, hundreds of developers. I've even written some of this stuff. Um, and it has to look at up to three, 30 million pieces of data per event. That's because, for example, there's 100 million channels 
um, in that inner, track, inner tracking detector alone. The innermost detector is 100 million pieces of data that can be read out. But you'll never have all 100 at once that was saturated, but when you look at the fraction that's readable to be looked at, it's, it's, it can be up to 30 million pieces. So this is an enormous amount of data, and that's why you need so many different algorithms to look at it. And, uh, yeah, um, let's see, right. Okay, so that's basically the process of reconstruction. I'm not gonna go through any of these steps in detail, but basically it's a, it's a continual process of taking smaller pieces of data, linking them together to form objects, and then using those each little object to build up an electron or to build up a uh, muon. Yeah? Uh, granted, of course, it says, I love that this is complex, but I can't relate it to the so-called uh, DNA chips. So are you taking each channel, applying the algorithm on it, and then using an array sort of way out? Before, or, or is this part of the re re reconstruction that goes on? So you, what you're doing is you're really associating, so there's different levels. So for example, each piece in the detector gets a calibration, so that's one algorithm. So you translate, the, for example, the amount of current that's read out of a little pixel Little, a little, uh, one of those little pixel elements, <coughs> and you translate that into the amount of charge that's been produced, that a uh, particle passed through produced, and then, um, and then you associate those different elements together to form a trajectory. Okay. So it's, it's, it's different levels of association. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, big story on the uh, Cancery Nobel Prize for 2013 was that instead of physical experiments, computer simulations and modeling were used. Instead, given everything that you've said, I was yeah. wondering if that approach would be helpful for your work or if the issue's too complex. Oh yes, yeah. so we, we use simulation extensively, and I'll talk about that next week. Okay. So we can't make sense of any of our data without simulation. Okay. All right, so move on. Um, so basically where, so I told you this 54 terabytes a day and it's all being processed with 100 millions of lines of code, how is this actually done? Well, it's stored in, two, okay, well we can look at where it's stored and that's the worldwide LHC computing grid and it's also processed on the worldwide LHC computing grid. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that. So what is it? So these are two snapshots of the grid. So the grid is um, it's comprised of a massive computing center at CERN. But you can't do all this computing at CERN. Basically, the amount of power it would take to run all the computers to do all that processing is way too high to be had in one, any one place. So we have this tiered approach. So there's the massive computing center at CERN, and then these are all directly connected to 11 what we call tier one sites. And these are also very massive computing centers, but they're distributed around the world. So in the US, we have two of these. We have one at Brookhaven, Brookhaven National Lab, um, and one at Fermilab, here, Fermilab. Um, and then all of these, what we call tier ones, are then connected to about 140 tier twos. So tier twos are smaller <coughs> processing sites. We have one here at University of Chicago that's linked, that's, a, that's in a consortium with, with University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and University of Indiana at Bloomington. And so the three of our institutions together make um, one of these tier twos, and we process a ton of the data. So this shows um, a pie chart of the total computing resources. So this includes disk and CPU. So basically, this includes the um, processing that allows you to run the algorithms, but then also all the places where you store the data. And so you can see that CERN has about 10% of that, um, these are these tier ones. This part has, you know, another 30%, and then the rest comes uh, in these tier twos at places like um, the Midwest tier two, which is the one that we have here at Chicago. So I wanted to show you something pretty cool. I think. So we. So we can look at right now in the world where all of the data processing is happening on the LHC grid. So this is Google Earth, and it's syncing to right now to a certain server that is going to tell us between each one of those tier two sites and each one of those tier two uh, tier one sites where the where the data are happening. And it looks like it's still yes, okay. So this is for right now. So um, from 
11.30 to 11.40. We can play the data thing. Let me do this here. Play. All right. I know it scares you to think for a minute because it's hard for the display on the screen. It is. But what we're looking at now is every single one of these green lines is a data transfer link between two of these sites. And we're zooming now into something in, I, I don't know why I'm zooming into HLT2. Um, hold on, let me get this here. Move it out. So this is one tier two center. I don't know where AGLT2 is. It looks like it's in Detroit. Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor, yeah, maybe that is Ann Arbor. So here you can see a site here. Um, this is NYU's. This is Harvard, or Harvard Boston, Tufts, Brown. Um, here we go over here to zoom in on uh, Chicago. So we can see our Midwest here, too. So what we see here, here's our Midwest here, too. And this, the green line shown outgoing jobs, I think the red ones show incoming jobs, and then if we look, I don't know why the Shedding Aquarium comes up, I think it's a little bit We're not doing anything with the Shedding Aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> ah, not what I want. Um, okay, so sorry, there's a way that if I, I oh, here, I have a mouse, there's a point of why I put a mouse on here. It's like, it is a little, it's the dolphins up there. Yeah, <laughs> there's a the good dolphin, <laughs> that's our secret for sharing the community with the dolphins. Right, so we can see that the Midwest Tier 2, um, over the past 24 hours, had ran uh, 55,000 different computing jobs. Um, and sorry, if I, uh, this is something that I have to make sure I don't hurt my hands while I'm typing too much. Um, and 87% uh, of them were successful, 15 of them failed. Um, that's like just jobs crashing, like the computer crashes. Usually it's not because the computers had a problem, it's because the person who wrote the code wrote something <clears throat> wrong. Um, let me just zoom out a little bit and I'll just show you where CERN is. So there, there's the connections across the US. Here we can see, and CERN is right, it's like right there in the middle. <laughs> So we're really having, uh, and this is the case, this is the middle of the night in Europe, right? So, um, but right now there's, so the data rate's a little lower than it's normally, but it's still in the, in the entire world, there's um, 300,000 jobs running. So 300 different programs running, and then um, data is being transferred on average over all of these different links at um, 3.6 gigabits per second. And just to give you a scale, like a really fast link, um, or like a, a, a pretty fast thing is 10 gigabits per second. So this is a, a really huge amount of data that's being processed. And we're sending things. We have the South African institution um, on Atlas. We have a few in Australia. There's a bunch in Japan and Taiwan. Taiwan actually is a huge center. Um, this is all wireless transmitted or is No, so, oh, so this is interesting. So let me go back to my slides. Um, it's not wireless transmitted. Um, most of these are on physical networks. So actually under, somewhere downtown, it's under, I don't know which building. I mean, it's, it's somewhere in the middle of downtown, there's this huge network link. It's a physical network link. That's 10 gigabits, or maybe it's even, I don't know if it's 10 or 100 gigabits per second, but that, that's what we use to connect to different, to, to different sites. And CERN actually, oh, I'll go back to it. So CERN, the, the, these tier ones are connected to CERN on a dedicated um, optical fiber network. It's called the CERN private optical fiber, uh, LHC private optical fiber network. Are there any tier one or tier, tier two in uh, Russia, India? So, uh, Russia, I'm no. Sorry, one, but any, tier two, oh, tier two, yes. Yeah, uh, tier two is for sure. Um, definitely Russian tier twos. Uh, I think there's probably an Indian one, although I'm not sure. I didn't see any when you had your goal. They might not be running right now. So those are the ones, only ones that are running right now. There are there are Russian ones. Seems like a lot of trouble to go to. So they call these. No, well, but it's it's amazingly efficient. I mean, this is how we've been able to um, process the Higgs data so quickly. It really would not have been possible without it. 
and this is like a, yeah, and it's also the nice thing is that these networks, so we set up this big network for um, certain, there's a North American, there's a big North American one, there's a big European one, and there's a few others, and when the LHC is a processing data, other academic institutions can run their own programs on it, so um, it has a nice uh, overlap, yeah. Uh, it's way too cool, I agree. Uh, is there anything closer to it? I mean, uh, just a little side here. Protein folding, for example, why can we use technology like this? It's absolutely mind boggling. I, so it's, I think they do. So um, a lot of these resources are shared. So one of the cool things we have going on here at the university is. Um, our, we have a network that's common with, with all other uh, big computing centers on campus, and we share time. So that means if some computer's not running um, in the biology section, we can run our jobs and then vice versa. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Um, I just wanted to show you, um, this just gives you a sense. These are all the tier twos. Um, around, I think mean, these are the Atlas Tier 2, so just for my experiments, there's a bunch of them. Each color is a different Tier 2, and this shows um, for one month the, all the successful jobs that were running. And the really nice thing is uh, we at Chicago, this Midwest Tier 2, was the green ones, were the second second most successful running site, so we're proud of that. So we, always, we always tell it to people. This big one is that Tier 1, the Brookhaven okay, Tier 1. So we're the best, at least during this time period, we're the most successful uh, tier two. Um, and then this just shows over the course of, um, from May 2012, for, uh, for every day actually, um, the amount of time spent computing. Um, so this is in billions of seconds, so we're doing about average of four billion seconds of computing a day. Um, and this is just for the past, uh, for the past like year, and a third. And so you can see here, here's November, so this, this is the holidays, Christmas. This is right after a really big conference, so nobody was running anything, so we all took a break for about a month. You can see that there's a whole lot of, uh, of stuff going on, and each one of these is a different experiment, each color. And it's kind of cool. I, I, this is really neat. Um, so to put this into some perspective, though, um, this was something from Wired Magazine where they looked at the amount of data um, for various well-known um, entities. So this is the amount of data produced by the LHC. So what this means is all the data that we read off the detector. So what I was talking about, that's this 54 terabytes of data per day. So this, is, so this is us compared to the amount of data generated in a year by Google searches or by people uploading pictures of what they ate yesterday to Facebook, um, <laughs> or YouTube videos. But this is kind of interesting. So this is the amount of data that's generated by the LHC, by, by the LHC itself. So that means that there's electronics readouts. This, and that's for all experiments. So that's for Atlas, for CMS, and, and for the other ones. This is the current Atlas data set. So this includes all the data, all the simulation that we use to understand the data, and all the um, data that we derive from this, from the, from the electronic signals. So you can see that we're doing 10 times more processing um, in order to understand that data that comes off the detector. So it's really, it's even bigger than this. Um, and yeah, so I think that was what I wanted to say about that. So, so that's really, um, that's what I wanted to say about the great computing. Are there any more questions about that? So there's 10 minutes left. I will talk a little bit about what I've been working on for the last two years. It's a project that we're doing here at Chicago and also with a bunch of collaborators. So there's collaborators in, um, at Argonne National Laboratory, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and then a bunch of collaborators in Italy. And what we're doing is we want to take that second level picture where, remember I showed you, we only have these cones coming in and allow us to see in detail this inner part, the tracking material, the tracking information. And the reason why you'd want to do that is because this has the most information about each individual particle. Each individual charged particle, you know its trajectory if you can reconstruct all the information in this detector. But the problem is that's so much data to read out that it's very hard to do. So what we're doing is we're making a way for us to have that the second level um, have this picture as well added into knowing this and this. 
So we do this um, with custom hardware. So there's basically two components to it. So one is essentially bingo. We take the different trajectories in the detector, um, in that tracking detector, that inner tracking detector, and we store them. And then we have electronics that sits and sees um, if the trajectories in the detector match to something that we expect looks like a track. And so that's bingo, really. You have like each little, what we call a pattern, each little element of, of the system is sitting and looking and seeing if its pattern appeared in that event. And if it does, it say, oh, I got to have a track, and it sends it off. So that's the bingo part. And then we then look at it to see, okay, inside of that pattern, is there something that looks like a charged particle pass through? So being able to do this, so this, this typically takes a really long time if you do it in software, but we have custom electronics to do this. And it's composed of many, many working parts. So there's this, there's one, two, three, four, five, six basically moving parts in the system. So Chicago is responsible for one little one. It's just basically to show you that that there's a ton of things that go into making this, and, and each one of these is replicated um, 64 times. Um, and then these are our custom electronics boards. So this is the one that we built at Chicago. This is our little test stand over a block away where we're really testing data transfers from one of these boards to the next. So, um, yeah, that's more or less what I wanted to show you from them. The fact that we have a lot of complex electronics that goes into doing things like making this sure clearer. So that's that. Do you have, do you have any questions? Yes? Are you using FPGAs or are they custom? We do both. So the part that the part that's used being done in Chicago, this, these are all FPGAs. Each one of these is a little processor, a little little um, processor which we can buy from a company and then configure to use the way to, to work the way we want them to work. Um, the custom stuff is another part of the system, um, and there it's we really design we design the internals of this. So that's being done by our Italian colleagues. Yeah. FPGA, whatever it is. FPGA. Uh -huh. what, what is it? Hmm. So it's um. So it's kind of like it's a little hard to let's see. But the best way to explain it, it's kind of like um, a CPU. So it's kind of like the little processor in your computer, your little that that does all the computations. But but basically in this, they, that's laid out in a very specific way. For us, it's basically um, a set of little logic elements, so a set of little things that say, does this signal and this single signal, does, does, is, does that signal the, okay, sorry, this is really, I'm not doing a very good job of this. Um, it's basically a set of very densely packed logic elements. So things where we can say, is it A plus B or A or B? Um, and we can use that to, to determine whether or not we have a signal over a certain threshold or add different signals together. So That's um, yeah, so it's a little bit it's it's much more flexible than that. So we can we we can configure it to do pretty much anything we want. So you can have one you can have something that just counts. Um, it basically just processes different data streams and um, sends them on to the rest of the system. What are the registers? So-called accumulators. What are they actually storing? Are they oh, these are storing. So it does a lot. Of, so this, this this thing does a lot. So it stores the the hits from that inner tracking detector. Um, it receives those patterns that I talked about. So it receives those, and then it also does um, it uh, tries to match those patterns to trajectories all on this board. It doesn't find the patterns, but it does the matching. Yeah. Speed resolution of the ADCs. Ooh, uh, this is all digital. So actually, so this is all digital. Our all our incoming data is digital. So that's these I think are just um, these are just power supplies or reg uh, regulators. Sorry. Yeah. I wish I could brought one in, but we're at, we're still testing them, so I can take them out of the stand. <laughs> yeah. How <coughs> how are the hackers doing? Ah, so I was, yeah, so um, so CMS has been hacked. So, so if people don't, it, hackers tend to not 
mess with us in the sense of put viruses in. But there was something funny. CMS had some server, some web page that um, where hackers got in and basically put up a message being like, look, it's really easy to hack you. You should protect yourself from this. So there's only been benevolent hacking at this point. The stuff at CERN is behind a big firewall, and so that's very secure. Um, and then each of these other networks has their own security. But one thing that's interesting is that all of this, uh, all of this code that I showed here, this is open source code. I mean, it's not like you could do much with it, but it's publicly available. You can't, the data is not publicly available. Although I did post on the website yesterday that um, CMS has moved to make some of the data publicly available. Really? But, um, but this, this, this level is there. Anybody can look at it and see what we're doing. It's hard to make sense of it, though. Yeah. Uh, I liked your uh, uh, slide with the circles showing the different amount, comparing the different amounts. Is, is that, is it, where, where is that available? The comparing the this the uh, no no keep going Facebook Facebook oh Facebook yeah right there yeah, yeah. so it's this this is the um, the link and I'll post this on the web page so you can have it but this is from Wired magazine and I, I think I assume they have links to where they um, they found and this is actually from a talk this slide I took from this talk here um, which talks about all the sort of computing mm -hmm. challenges. It's very technical, um, but if people are interested in the details of the computing. Uh, all this will be linked. Will be linked on the website. Yeah. I guess it's like that sort of made me nervous. I mean, I mean, the programming, the coding is open source, and yet we're talking about the like, high security of some sort. And oh, it's just the the networks that the data is passed on. That's secure. But the code that we use to look at it, the, the, basically the, the source code is available. Uh, it's publicly available. Yeah. What, what language, what computer language is it? So it's mostly in C++. Um, and that because C++ is really good for um, very fast computing. And then um, <coughs> we also use a lot of Python. You also use what? Python. Python. Yeah. Python is a very, very flexible programming language, so it's really good for configuring things, and it's really good for doing a huge range of stuff. The thing it's not very good at is processing data really quickly. <laughs> so we can't use that for our core stuff, but we do use a lot of it. Um, yeah? Does uh, quantum entanglement apply to the Higgs or not? Oh, uh, I, I, I would have to look that up. I do not know off the top of my head. I mean, if you produce two Higgses, in the same, yeah, I, I, not not in this scale for sure. Because we're only ever producing one at once, but and that also I think is really only applicable at very low energies. So so basically, if we're, we're always producing them at high energy, where all that stuff gets washed out. But I do not know much about that. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. The human genome uh -huh. circle would be kind of small, and the NSA circle. Would it be bigger than yeah. everything you got there? Yeah, the NSA is, so it's a 5,000 exabytes, and an exabyte is a 1,000 petabytes. So, it, it, yeah, so that's so um, that's 50,000 times space this. But apparently, I don't know where he gets this thing about um, we're, we're more fast efficient, but apparently we're much more fast efficient. <laughs> how do we know? Yeah, I don't know how he does that. But yeah, that, that's pretty. Um, that's pretty interesting. I mean, in 2012, in the entire internet, I think, or maybe in the entire world, I'm not sure. They said that there was um, this much data created or replicated. So, um, in the world, which is 800 exabytes. All right. So we've reached noon. Um, I'm here to, free to take questions, but if anybody wants to look, I'm ready to